Well, I don't think the world had any comprehension of what was going on in China in 1949, 1950, 1952. They were trying to overcome enormous problems and move towards their idea of what China could become again. The, um, the West treated China as a communist country and tried to isolate it and hoped that the regime would fall. And the Chinese themselves were trying to uh, feed themselves, trying to uh, look after themselves. But behind that was 18 of the last 20 centuries where China was the largest economy in the world. From 1952 onwards, the icebreakers were involved in doing the first um, elements of foreign trade again between China and uh, Europe. When I got involved in 72, it was um, to open up the um, United States trade with China. And we did the first big deals between the United States and China. By the time the Gang of Four had been overthrown and the reform and opening up period was about to start, what we had to um, come to terms with was understanding the incredible dynamic of China, the incredible dynamic of socialism, and get some sense of what the Chinese were now about to do between 1978 and today. And that was to build a modern economy. That was to take something approaching eight or 900 million people off the land in agriculture and replace it by mechanized agriculture so they could feed themselves to take those people and build a new manufacturing industry and at the same time to start building a new modern services industry. All of that incredible transformation which occurred in other countries over 150 years or so occurred in China in 40 years. It's quite incredible sometimes when I look back to 1952 and I see a picture of my dad and uh, his arranging to go to China in 1953 uh, I mean, it must have been an incredible decision to put his life um, into China. People must have thought he was crazy for this remote, distant country uh, to be somewhere where he was going to try and open up the trade relations again with. As it started, I came across a product and a, uh, from that developed a project which was very simply to put the filters on the cigarettes in China, that this became the greatest source of income for the Chinese state in the 1990s. But what we did was we created the concept of trade with technology. Up until then, the Chinese used to do business buying and selling, and the technology imports were handled by a completely different route. What we said was, if you put these two things together, we will help you get into the business of making the raw material for filters, and at the same time, by buying our materials that you need in the, in the, in the short and ended up in the long term as well, um, you will give us what we need, which is to fill up the Western factory's capacity. And to do that, the Chinese created a vehicle called the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration, which brought together the domestic industry and foreign trade. And that later became the, the typical example of how China operated its domestic industries, that they had a foreign trade section instead of isolating it all in a foreign trade group. You know, dealing with China is a fascinating um, kaleidoscope of, of, of firsts. So we got this request to take a British football team to China. And we realized that it was about um, the fact that China had been boycotted from and kept, kept separated from the international world of football. And they wanted us to be the icebreakers who broke down that barrier. And over the course of the months uh, through till um, early 78, we negotiated through some fascinating situations uh, to get West Bromwich Albion to make that first trip to China. And that was part of um, all the build-up to 1978 and the launching of reform and opening up. And that football um, match that occurred in Beijing, midway through the second half, there was suddenly a great roar. And we looked around and we couldn't see any reason for the roar. It was 25 years later that I found out that Deng Xiaoping was at the match, probably the originator of the request to get the football team there. And he stood up um, and walked and waved to the crowd. And it was his first public appearance at our football match. And it took 25 years for me to find out because it was confidential. <laughs> so uh, another great uh, 
moment of uh, ice breaking that I was involved in was opening the market for Western musicals in China. A uh, really useful group asked me to help them work out how they could get involved in China. And uh, I told them after some thinking about it that they needed a, a concert of their works, of Andrew Lloyd Webber's works, presented in the Great Hall of the People. And they said, had anything like that ever been done before? And I said, uh, I don't think so. But that was the beginning of musicals in China. We took all the major musicals and we did the first um, uh, version of uh, Les Miserables in Chinese. Uh, it was just fascinating. But what I think um, is the great opportunity is not the great... It, it is a significant opportunity for Western musicals in China. The great opportunity is to find a way of synergizing the Chinese cultural uh, together with the Western culture and producing uh, musicals in a modern form but drawing on both countries' histories um, uh, to play to world audiences. That will happen, I'm quite sure. And so for the opportunity now for foreign businessmen is to fully comprehend where the Chinese are trying to go and in their own sector and in their own business try and engage with it so that they are working uh, together with the Chinese over the next 30 years. It is between now and 2049 that the Chinese new era will come into place. And um, we've got the opportunity to be part of that.